Hi, this is Ash Whitener. And this is Justin Blinko. And welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. On December 4th and 5th, we went to Mexico City to interview some of the brightest entrepreneurs in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space at the Latin American Bitcoin Conference. We left with a number of amazing interviews, and we're really excited to share one of them with you today. Please help us out by following us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Show notes with links and contact info to everyone we speak with can be found on our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com. Enjoy the show. If you want to save 5 to 20% off of everything at Amazon using Bitcoin and support Liberty Entrepreneurs with no cost to you, check out the show notes at libertyentrepreneurs.com and sign up for an account with purse.io using our affiliate link. Welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. This is day two at the Latin American Bitcoin Conference in Mexico City, Mexico. We're here with Ira Miller, this co-founder and CEO of Coinapult, and he is the current founder of Deginner, an open source software development team concentrating on software tools for businesses and entrepreneurs. He currently lives in Panama City, Panama, and has been in the Bitcoin space since 2011. Ira, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Ash. It's uh, been a pleasure. I've been looking forward to coming on for a while. So, Ira, you got into Bitcoin in 2011. That is very early. Can you tell us how you got in so early? Sure. At first, you know, I'm an engineer, so uh, my interest at first was was purely in the technical aspects of it. But I also am interested in economics and uh, freedom and the the tools that can enable freedom more. Uh, so Bitcoin immediately struck me as having huge potential in, in this area. Uh, at the time, I had uh, a small software development firm just doing consulting for, for businesses in Denver, Colorado. And I basically took one down all my contracts and, and just dove headfirst into developing Bitcoin things and just experimenting, playing with it and seeing what, what could be built. Yeah, so I imagine back then Bitcoin was fairly difficult to get a hold of, and you know it was very illiquid back then. There weren't a whole lot of exchanges. Not only could you not buy it from exchanges, but you, there was no such thing as local Bitcoins, and you, you simply could not get Bitcoin. How did you remedy that? Yeah, it's, it was really hard back in 2011. At the time, Mt. Gox was the only exchange. A trade Hill opened soon after I, I got involved in Bitcoin, but they were only open for a, a short time. With Mt. Gox, it was very hard to, to get your fiat money in. I was not really an expert in financial services prior to, to getting into Bitcoin. I don't think I'd ever sent international wire. Uh, and at the time, I think an international wire was, was the only way to get dollars into Mt. Gox. And uh, like many people, that just kind of freaked me out a little, a little too, too much. Uh, I wasn't ready to send my money to some, yeah, to Japan, to, to some untrustworthy fat, fat guy with a latte and a cat. <laughs> uh, I didn't know he was, was untrustworthy at the time. But uh, so what I ended up doing is, is starting my own business uh, with some of the tools and things that I was experimenting with just as a way to acquire Bitcoin. It was called Bitmunchies, and basically all I did is I went down to, to Sam's Club. I got a, a membership and a notebook and wrote down the prices of a bunch of things I could buy in bulk. Uh, made a, a OS Commerce site and a Bitcoin payment plugin for it, and just put the, the stuff straight off Sam's Club right onto the, the website. Do you su suspect there was any synergies between Silk Road and Bitmunchies? Do you think the hunger created by Silk Road was satisfied by Bitmunchies? Did you see that in your business? Well, people did tend to buy a lot of munchies type food, <laughs> and, and that was our, our signature. So uh, I don't I don't know of any any specific customers, but I would not be surprised if uh, Cheetos and, and weed went together. So let me get this straight: you had such difficulty acquiring Bitcoin that what you did was create a business called BitMunchies that you would basically just wholesale stuff out to the internet and you'd ship it out and you'd get paid in Bitcoin just so you could acquire Bitcoin. That's, that's correct, yeah. 
Right. And, and now it's so easy to buy Bitcoin. I mean, relatively speaking, you know, I- anyone can send money to Circle or, you know, BitPay or something like that and buy Bitcoin in seemingly less than an hour. And you started an entire business. That's that, that's great. That's the real entrepreneurial spirit right there. Well, thank you. It's uh, what I had to do, you know. <laughs> yeah. So you're living in Panama City now and you're working for and owning. You founded Deginner. Tell us a little bit about that. See, so yeah, I, I co-founded Deginner uh, after uh, we sold Coinapult earlier this year. I co-founded it with Coinapult's uh, ex-CTO. And what we do is we build open source tools for uh, businesses. A lot of the, the tools that Bitcoin services are using are pretty generic. Uh, you know, you need a multi-sig wallet. You need some sort of broker interface to convert Bitcoins to other currencies and, and back uh, you need a lot of people are starting up exchanges in you know various parts of the world, and why should they all write their own software? Uh, so we we figured we'd write it well, we'd write it once, uh, and then we'd offer it to to all these startups and companies around the world who want to build Bitcoin services. Help help me understand potential revenue or the business model of offering open source code because this is something that you know has been around for a long time. I remember playing with Linux back in the late '90s and. You know, back then it was awkward and a little bit clunky, but it was really neat because there were so many versions of it that could come out since it was open source. And, you know, the whole open versus closed source uh, software environment really struck me early on. Tell us a little bit more about your ideas of the open source software that you're producing and like the business sense behind it. I think that's a, a really good question. Uh, and it, it's a question that the open source community has been uh, questioning for, for decades. You know, how can we how can we monetize this? How can we survive uh, building tools like this, even though it's clearly superior from an engineering perspective. Uh, it's very difficult from a business perspective. And I think that you really see this in the Bitcoin space right now uh, because you you kind of had two generic categories of projects. There's the, the science project type, uh, to paraphrase Trace Mayer, who uh, <laughs> uses that term a lot. Uh, and then there's the, the really formal incorporate, get VC funding, at, you know, get regulated, get licensed types. And I think what's really missing is a viable model for an open source project that doesn't involve incorporation and interfacing in a, a comprehensive way with the, the old structure. You know, the promise of this technology is to overthrow all these systems. You're not going to do it by, by joining them. And so I, I've been really thinking about this problem a lot of how can you create an open source project and make a business out of it without compromising your values and the goals of your, your project. Uh, and I think that I've come up with a, a, a theory okay. for how to, how to, how to do this. Uh, and it's called Research and Develop Open Ventures. Uh, and basically, an open venture is a project that's for profit. You know, it's for a venture, right? But specifically with open source code, open source intellectual resources. And the research and develop part is that the business model is for R&D teams. Uh, so it's for the people that actually build uh, these open source tools and, and how do you, once you've built it, how do you make money off of it? You're basically trying to find a platform for open source developers and entrepreneurs who are looking for source code of some sort to come together, is that right? Well, we, we are planning to build a platform for this. Uh, and it will be open source and it will plug into GitHub, for instance, so that people with projects on GitHub can just register their project and, and start making support agreements and uh, attracting sponsorships and things like that. But mostly this is just business best practices. Uh, so if you go to rdov.co, there's a white paper which describes the business model. It's The white paper itself is open source. It can apply to uh, many, many different types of open source projects. And we're already, a lot of people are already applying some of the practices, the support agreements and getting sponsorship for your project. Uh, this is just a kind of comprehensive way to, to maximize your effective uh, outcome as an open source project. So would you say that this is like, for now, a a loose business plan structure for open source developers to try to you know, use this structure so that we can more easily evaluate open source code in general? I think that's, that's pretty close. What I really was hoping to do uh, was create a viable uh, capital growth path for open source projects. So you, know, you, you start the project, maybe you get some users, maybe you even have some, some small revenue from support agreements or things like that. But as it scales up, how do you stay, how do you stay in the same form that you're in? You know, I think a lot of 
a lot of projects, once they get to a certain level, they realize that they need other skill sets, they need to hire people, they need to raise funds, and they end up incorporating and going down the, that exact same traditional path that ultimately, I think, compromises some of their ability to innovate. Let's change the past a little bit, Ira. You've been living in Latin America now and, and focusing on entrepreneurship. What can you tell us about uh, what entrepreneurs are doing in Latin America, where they're focusing, what issues they're having? That, that's a fascinating question. I, I know you've spent a lot of time traveling around Latin America as well, Justin, so I'd love to hear if, if you have a similar view. But I find Latin Americans to be extremely entrepreneurial. They often criticize themselves saying that they're not. And I think that it's because in Latin America you have two economies, and they often discount the informal economy, uh, which is the system D, the gray market. You know, In Panama, for instance, I think 50 or 60 percent of the people work in system D, uh, which is to say they're micro entrepreneurs or they, they work for other micro entrepreneurs. Just define system D for us. Sure. System D, it comes from système de brioude. Uh, I think I said that right, which is a French Caribbean word uh, term, which basically means just get shit done. Uh, and it... However. Uh, yeah, however you can. In modern English usage, it typically means doing things in a gray way, under the table, informally. But to, to get back to Justin's question, I think that Latin Americans are extremely entrepreneurial. And the main, there's, the main problem that entrepreneurs in Latin America have is jumping from the informal economy into the formal economy. Or, or put a different way, jumping from a local uh, informal economy into a, a larger scale of operations, international sales, things like that. It doesn't necessarily have to be formal, but up till now, the formal routes were the only way to do that, and they had trouble getting into those formal routes. What were the main troubles that the system D had from scaling up? Was it since they were doing under the table, you know, what, called under the table, like not paying taxes or stuff like that, that they had more trouble seeming legitimate or they had more trouble hiring people or like what what is it that holds the system d people back from actually scaling out a business well i think a lot of the the system d entrepreneurs uh are their businesses are very small uh they they probably don't actually have the credit and resources to be allowed into the formal system now, a lot of them probably would like to be in the formal system they're not just trying to evade taxes because you know, it saves them a little bit of money, uh, they're, they've been locked out of, of these systems. And uh, I think that uh, Bitcoin and, and some of these, these new technologies are the only real hope for them because banks and, and their governments have, f for decades and decades, chosen to ignore these problems. Yeah, I agree that System D people are very entrepreneurial because these are the people that are first looking at pains in their life and they're like, crap, I can't get a bank account. Right? I don't have a debit card. None of my friends do either. You know, we, we probably don't have cars and the bus is a pain in the ass to go down and buy groceries. So I will start offering the fruits and vegetables that I grow in my garden right here on my street corner and you can just come buy them for me, you know, and it's just a mutually beneficial interaction here. Right? So they're very entrepreneurial. I, I think uh, Diego uh, said it really well yesterday in his Sistema Day presentation that if you can't have access to the larger financial system, you, you're stuck trading it within your own circle of poverty. And you're never going to get out. You're never going to make much more than anyone around you if you can only trade with your neighbors who are just as poor as you. Right. And whenever we have a closed monetary system like we do right now, if you're not plugged into that monetary system, a bank account, the ability to make purchases online or have credit cards and stuff like that, you're going to remain in that poor local area for for maybe forever. I don't, I don't know. That's the beautiful thing about Bitcoin. Like you said, is now even the smallest entrepreneur, the system D or the solo entrepreneur, they have the ability to control their money in microtransactions without having to trust a third party. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing technology. I think, uh, you know, Latin America has been the fastest growing market for Bitcoin and, and there's a clear reason why there's a, a clear and obvious need here and people are excited about it. Among entrepreneurs that aren't focused in the Bitcoin space, are you seeing any themes as to what type of businesses are being built here? Is it technological? Is it food? Is it distribution, retail? Is there any sort of theme that you're seeing? Yeah, I've actually uh, recently been, been very involved in the, the startup and entrepreneurial community in Panama. Uh, I'm helping to, to start a, a local chapter of the Founder Institute, which is a global uh, entrepreneurship incubator. 
And uh, it's based out of Silicon Valley. There are chapters all over Latin America, in, in Colombia, in Chile, in, in Argentina. Uh, but this is the first chapter in, in Panama. And for the last three months, we've been uh, hosting events for, for uh, entrepreneurs and uh, had hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, people come to these events. And it's been very interesting hearing, hearing their ideas. And uh, most of them are, are trying to make scalable tech products. Uh, a lot of them are, are interested in the sharing economy, in uh, kind of the Uber type products or uh, online education. Uh, these seem to be really hot topics in Latin American startups, just like they are in Silicon Valley. If you have one piece of advice for young entrepreneurs, what would it be? Do what you're excited about and don't worry about what other people think. Excellent. Ira, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.